China is flexing its muscle. Can anything be done to stop them? Plus, a WNBA baller. I'm Monica Wright, number 22 for the Minnesota Lynx. In the game of her life. What did I do? What was my legacy? Hear how she became a true champion on today's 700 Club. And they were just like, this is the Monica we know. Welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. A nightmare is unfolding around the world. We learn now that China is warning that North Korea has assembled a tremendous arsenal of nuclear weapons. The number I had heard a few years ago was six. Now they say it's 20 and they could increase very rapidly. On top of that, the uh, Iranians sending warships down off the coast of the Gulf of Aden. And uh, who knows what confrontation might come about. They're fast building a nuclear device. And then they also have the uh, capability of sending them long range. What is going to happen to our world if crazy people, fanatical regimes, have their hands on this weapons of terror and are able to bring them to bear on their neighbors or even as far away as Europe or the United States? Mm. Wendy? That's a great question. Well, China says the North Koreans could soon build even more nuclear weapons, threatening America and most of Europe. George Thomas brings us the story. The North Koreans may have as many as 20 nuclear warheads, and that number could climb to 50 or 100 in the next five years. According to the Wall Street Journal, Chinese nuclear experts are also warning that North Korea's ability to produce weapons-grade uranium could double by next year. And this assessment comes as a top U.S. official believes North Korea can now launch a missile with a nuclear warhead that could reach much of the western United States. Admiral William Gortney, head of U.S. Northern Command, says, our assessment is that they have the ability to put a nuclear weapon on a KN-08 and shoot it at the homeland. We assess that it's operational today, and so we practice to go against it. North Korea's expanding arsenal has Japan and South Korea particularly concerned. This week, the U.S. signed a new nuclear energy agreement, allowing South Korea to conduct nuclear research, but not to produce its own nuclear fuel. It is an agreement befitting of the deep partnership and strong alliance that exists between our two countries. A top North Korean shot back at the agreement, calling America's foreign policy hostile to the region. The anachronistic hostile policy of the U.S. on the DPRK and its reckless confrontation mania prolonged the touch-and-go situation in the Korean peninsula. The revelation of the North's accelerated nuclear program has some Republican lawmakers worried about President Obama's deal with Iran that is supposed to limit its nuclear program. A 1996 agreement with North Korea was supposed to stop Pyongyang's nuclear capabilities. It didn't. Instead, now the North is building a set of nuclear weapons. The chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Ed Royce, told the journal he fears the same could happen with Iran. We saw how North Korea was able to game this whole process. I wouldn't be surprised if Iran had its hands on the same playbook. George Thomas, CBN News. So what do we do? Do we take preemptive steps to knock out <clears throat> that uh, nuclear capability before it gets operational? Or do we just sit back and then shake in our boots? Do you realize what a crazy dictator can do? He can say, we hold San Francisco or Los Angeles hostage. If you don't do what we want you to do, we will destroy two of your major cities because we can reach them and we have the capability. Are we going to allow that to happen? And then in the Middle East, we'll have Iran uh, clearly, clearly having uh, expressed the, their, their deep-held belief that Israel should be exterminated. Are we going to allow them to go ahead and do that? Will Israel go ahead and allow them to do that? I mean, we've got to be faced with these things. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, this takes a lot of prayer. But are we going to just sit idly by and allow these, these crazy regimes? North Korea is, 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 is like a criminal enterprise. It's a crime family in charge of a nation. And over in Iran, it's uh, 
Islamic fun fanatics in charge of a nation. And they have the resources to do terrible, terrible things. Look at North Korea. They shut Sony down. They didn't like a movie that Sony was put out. They literally shut the thing down with cyber attacks. North Korea did that to Sony, to an American corporation. What could they do with nuclear weapons? Hmm. Well, in other news, our CBN News terrorism analyst, Eric Steichelbeck, warned about the dangers of terrorism recruiting in the state of Minnesota. And now that warning is proving to be prophetic. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. Thanks, Pat. Four young Minnesota men are in federal court today accused of conspiring to sneak into Syria to join ISIS. A total of six men between the ages of 19 and 21 were part of the plot. U.S. Attorney Andrew Luger says they had been planning for 10 months, even as co-conspirators were caught and charged. Be clear, we have a terror recruiting problem in Minnesota. And this dem case demonstrates how difficult it is to put an end to recruiting here. These are focused men who are intent on joining a terrorist organization by any means possible. Two of the suspects made it to California where they were also facing charges. One of them posted jihadist images on Facebook and told an informant last year, there's nothing for me in this world. Authorities say dozens of young Somali men have traveled from Minnesota to join terrorist groups in Somalia and Syria. Well, new details are emerging about the man French authorities say planned a terror attack near Paris, this one targeting Christians. Today, we're getting a look at the suspect, Sid Ahmed Glam, a 24-year-old Algerian computer science student. Authorities believe he was planning a massacre similar to the attacks at Charlie Hebdo magazine and a kosher supermarket. This time it was Christians, French Catholics, who were targeted. On Sunday, Glom tried to carry out his plan in a quiet Paris suburb where police believe he killed a woman who was sitting in her car. Shortly afterward, he accidentally shot himself in the foot and called an ambulance for help. French officials say Glom was on a watch list of people potentially traveling to Syria. Right now, investigators want to know if anyone may have been working with him. And last night, police arrested a person suspected to be acquainted with Glom, but police Pat haven't yet released any further details. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, does any of this get to you? I mean, you hear these things, and, you know, we sit at a desk and, and give you the news of what's happening around the world. We, our reporters and our staff is tasked with finding out what's going on around the world. And there's some really frightening things. And the problem is we have a vacuum of leadership. So in Washington, you say, what, what's going to happen? Well, there's nobody who knows. And there's nobody who can tell us. I tell you, in my case, I, I find great comfort just at picking up the Bible and reading the Word of God and just realizing that God's in control of things. But this world is fast spinning out of control. And maybe that's what is going to happen before the Lord comes back. But it certainly is happening everywhere you turn. Radical Islam, communist ideology, uh, extremism, and just uh, madness seems to have seized a number of uh, societies. And now we have the sophistication and the weapons to do something terrible to ourselves unless somebody stops it. John? Pat, a surprise eruption from a volcano in Chile Wednesday. The Calbuco volcano erupted for the first time in more than 42 years, sending a huge cloud of ash over a sparsely populated mountain region a little more than 620 miles south of the capital of Santiago. The government issued a high alert, barring access, access around the area. The 6,500-foot volcano last erupted in 1972. It's considered one of the top three most potentially dangerous among Chile's 90 active volcanoes. Well, Israelis are celebrating their 67th national birthday, but the picnics and parties pale in comparison to the story that led to their independence. Chris Mitchell takes us to the heart of Tel Aviv, where it all began. Here in Independence Hall on May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared the formation of the State of Israel. For the first time in nearly 2,000 years, the Jewish people were a nation once again. This is where Israel was born. When people come here, they are astonished to see this place. Most of the people that visit here, their first reaction is, 
This is it. That's all you have here. Ben Gurion and his team look for an inconspicuous place to declare statehood. At the time, Independence Hall, one of the first buildings in Tel Aviv, was an art gallery. During a 1978 renovation, the decision was made to take the building back to its original look at the time of the declaration. Traveling in Israel will teach you that God has a tendency to perform his best miracles in the most humble places. This place is one of those places. According to Isaac Dror, who heads education at the hall, the establishment of Israel shook the world and became a haven for the Jewish people. How many people prayed for it every day when the Jews said next year in Jerusalem and next year in Jerusalem? That's what they meant. When Israel declared its independence, dancing filled the streets. But the celebration was short-lived. The very next day, armies of five Arab nations invaded the newborn state. When it comes to the story of the War of Independence, we don't have many answers there. Very hard for us to explain. Call it a miracle, call it whatever you want, but we are here. 130,000 people visit this tiny hall each year to hear about the miracle of Israel, including tourists like this group from Massachusetts. I didn't expect it to be um, so moving. Um, my whole life, Israel has always been here. So I think in some ways took it for granted. And now I you know, felt like I was here that day. After 2,000 years of wandering and persecution, for Jews to have their own state really has to be a miracle. Across the street is this monument with a scripture from Jeremiah. Again, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. Surrounded by skyscrapers, and a new generation visiting the hall, it's testament to God's faithfulness to his promise to build and rebuild the Jewish state and its people. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, at Independence Hall in Tel Aviv, Israel. Here at home, can the government put the squeeze on farmers who grow raisins? That was the question before the Supreme Court Wednesday. Justices expressed their doubts federal officials can legally take raisins away from farmers without giving them a full payment. The program came from a 1937 law to keep prices steady by managing the amount of raisins on the market. But two California farmers say the program is forbidden by the Constitution, and several justices seem to agree. Justice Antonin Scalia compared it to old-style Soviet planning. Pat, back to you. <laughs> Well, that's the crazy. That was part of the uh, New Deal of President Roosevelt. And uh, the remarkable thing was they had a law that said that uh, people who had too many pigs because they were trying to get the price of pork down, that they had to slaughter their pigs. And um, the Supreme Court actually upheld those uh, uh, laws that were put in place by Roosevelt during that Reconstruction time uh, back in the Depression, back in the 1930s. And um, it was shocking to think that they would extend the Commerce Clause to say that a pig grown in Nebraska, for example, was part of interstate commerce, and that a farmer growing that pig could be made to kill his pig because they had too much pork in the market. Mm. Well, that's the same law that's carrying out to, and they're forcing these raisin growers to destroy tons and tons, hundreds of tons of their raisin without paying them any money. And um, that's what brought this lawsuit about. And hopefully, at this point in time, the justices will say, no way, we can't do this to people anymore. But this is just one of many uh, lawsuits that's coming up now as craziness from some bygone era has taken hold of our nation in the year 2015 or 2016. Well, we've been talking, ladies and gentlemen, about the source of fat. We've been talking about nutrition. We've been talking, talking, talking. Well, a new group of scientists in England has reaffirmed maybe they were watching the 700 Club. John? <laughs> Pat, that's right. What makes people fat? Not getting enough exercise? Not necessarily so, says a group of health professionals, including cardiologists and sports experts. They say the real cause of the obesity epidemic is sugar and diabetes. Writing in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, they say poor diet causes more diseases than a lack of physical activity, alcohol, and smoking combined. They point out that people are just as active now as they were a few decades ago, but the obesity rate has skyrocketed. 
They write, this places the blame for our expanding waistlines directly on the type and amount of calories consumed. And they add, let us bust the myth of physical inactivity and obesity. You cannot outrun a bad diet. Pat, probably something you already knew. I've been talking about it, John, <laughs> for years right here on this program. I am pleased to report that I went back to the kitchen and I exercised my culinary skills and came up with something absolutely delicious and very helpful. Oh, do tell. Uh, lentil soup. Mm. Uh, Love lentils. Lentils and onions and celery and olive oil and, and you know. Very Mediterranean. Worcestershire and a few other things. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my wife said, well, why don't we put a lamb shank in it? So, okay, we put a lamb shank in it and boiled it and everything. Wow. It's absolutely delicious. Oh, my goodness. Do you have any left? <laughs> <laughs> you're <laughs> you're really invited, good. darling. <laughs> Pat's now, lentil soup. So this was a Pat original, pretty much. Pat yeah, and Dee Dee, Dee, Dee I, did. No, well, Dee Dee added to the Pat's hey. soup, but I... The salt and the pepper and, you know, Worcestershire sauce and a few things. And it's so good. I, I like to do that. But I'm, I'm, I just don't want to get into the kitchen. It's kind of a thing. But if you've got a great big carving knife that you can chop vegetables mm -hmm. with and a carving board, you can just go to town. I am you, a soup. I love this. I'm a soup yeah. person. Well, this, I, I'm this not is, a culinary genius, but I can do a couple soups. Well, I've, I've made my other soup was the uh, minestrone, and it, it was just dynamite. But I, I had everything in the kitchen set. I think it was so healthy it hurt. <laughs> I'm listening. I hope the guys in London are listening to us. Here's Amen. Wendy. All right. Well, up next, they're the world's most populated nation, and they're using their might to bully the little guy. They pointed their guns at us. We were afraid for our lives. Hear why China is staking their claim to the seas. Next. Well, if you used to read the funny papers, there was something called Terry and the Pirates. And Terry and the Pirates, the Pirates operated in what's called the South China Sea. It sounded so mysterious. Well, that's a part of the world few Americans ever think about. But now even a small disagreement on that area could turn into a flashpoint and easily escalate into a major battle in Southeast Asia. Gary Lane brings us that story from the Philippines. Bullying neighbors over territorial and water rights in the South China Sea. The Philippines is comprised of more than 7,000 islands, and for centuries, Filipino fishermen have fished these waters. They found abundant fish around the reefs and around the shoals, but now the word is out, stay away from the shoals. If they don't heed the warning, a Chinese Navy water cannon could take action, or the Chinese Coast Guard could ram their boat. Former Filipino fisherman Biani Mula and his friends used to haul in tons of fish along Scarborough Shoal. But today their boat, the Marvin II, sits idle, anchored offshore in Mansilok, Philippines. It's too dangerous for Biani and his friends to fish the shoal. Last Christmas, strong winds and rough seas caused Biani and other fishermen to seek shelter in Scarborough Shoal. That's when the Chinese Coast Guard approached them. They shouted, China Island, China Island, go back to Philippines. I said, huh? You are so far away from home, and you think this is a China Island? They pointed their guns at us. We were afraid for our lives. Biani now earns only about $12 per day driving a tricycle taxi. He made nearly $700 per month when he fished the shoal. The Scarborough Shoal is in the South China Sea. While it's 120 miles from the Philippines and 400 miles from China, the Chinese government claims the territory as its own. It falls within an ambiguous zone that China calls the Nine Dash Line, Chinese territorial waters. The Spratly and Paracel Islands also fall within that area. Such claim I, we, we think is uh, expansive, excessive, and uh, in gross violation of international law. Charles Jose is Philippines Foreign Ministry spokesman. If we leave this claim unchallenged, uh, the Philippines could be losing about 80% of our exclusive economic zone, uh, which could mean uh, robbing our nation of its wealth and depriving our people of their livelihood. 
China is also enforcing its claims by taking action against Malaysia and Vietnam. This video shows a Chinese ship ramming and sinking a Vietnamese boat. Why the aggressive moves? In addition to fish, the South China Sea is rich in oil and natural gas. And China has implemented an ambitious construction program to make its claims permanent. It's building oil platforms, aircraft landing strips, and even new islands. All of this has raised tensions between China and its South China Sea neighbors. Our Secretary of Foreign Affairs, uh, Albert Del Rosario, uh, in one of their in one of his meetings with his uh, Chinese counterpart, he gave his Chinese counterpart his uh, private uh, number. And uh, up to now, he has not uh, received a call from his uh, Ch Chinese counterpart. Richard Haydarian is a columnist and foreign affairs analyst. We don't have a hotline with China. Thankfully, nothing crazy happened in the high seas. But if, you can imagine what if there was a shooting. Accidents is not impossible. I mean, the probabilities keep on increasing. Something could happen and it could get out of control. This is becoming a real flashpoint. The, the, uh, the United States, in my view, has not been assertive enough in standing up for those nations which allow for this critical strategic waterway to be controlled by China. Now the question is, what can be done to prevent a greater conflict? It's not a slam dunk solution. Let's be very honest about that. Do not expect China packing its bag and going away. No, it's not going to leave what it already has. Perhaps at least the good thing we could do is prevent China from getting more island. The Philippines submitted the dispute to international oversight, but China has rejected arbitration, preferring one-on-one -on -one diplomacy. For now, fishermen like Biani Mula just want their livelihood back. It's okay for China to be there, but just let us fish. All we want to do is fish. Gary Lane, CBN News, Mansilog, Philippines. You know, the Navy now has 600 ships. It's got a force level that's comparable to what it was at the beginning of World War I. And there isn't enough money in the budget to take care of needed repairs. Uh, airplanes are critically short of spare parts. And we have allowed the Navy to go downhill. We need a robust Navy. If the Navy was doing what it should be, the South China Sea was an American lake. This was our territory, and the Pacific was our territory. We won it, clearly, after World War II. Nobody else asserted a claim. We beat the Japanese and took control of the Pacific area. That was ours as the United States. But it takes a robust fleet to do it. We're not talking now about nuclear confrontation. We're talking about some small vessels and a little bit more robust Navy, but the Chinese can't beat us, but they can certainly beat some Philippine fishermen. And though if they extend into the South China Sea before long, we will not be able to use that waterway anymore because China will say, this is our territory. Well, it's a bald-faced uh, uh, assertion of power uh, that is not uh, legally justified. But power seems to be the, uh, at least territory goes to those that are powerful. We can't allow that to happen, but are we willing for the, to take the confrontation? I don't think America is, has faced up to what is going on in the world, but we've got to have the forces. We have to have the force. We cannot cut back our army. We cannot cut back our air force, but particularly we cannot cut back our Navy. We probably ought to have 700 to 1,000 ships instead of 600, and a Navy uh, equipped to do that. And I don't know who's speaking out that way, but somebody needs to because we desperately, we've got the Mediterranean, the Seventh Fleet. We've got our whole Pacific Fleet out there. We've got whatever's going on in uh, Yemen. That has to be, those waters have to be patrolled by ships. Somehow we've got to assert and extend our influence with Navy. And we've got to protect our peaceful shipping and our commerce. And if we don't do it, we will be shut down and become like a little island where we can't move anymore. We don't want another Pearl Harbor. We just can't afford it. Wendy? All right, well, up next, she's a two-time WNBA champ, a former college basketball player of the year, one of the best athletes in school history, and it wasn't enough. Me as a person, I'm not who I want to be. I felt like there was something missing. Minnesota Lynx Monica Wright tells us how she found her love of the game next.
Years ago, women played basketball, girls basketball, with a half a court. None of this rough and tumble stuff. And suddenly, women's basketball has emerged into a tremendous sport, very popular and very active. And Monica Wright is one of the best. She's done jerseys for the University of Virginia, the Minnesota Lynx, and Team USA and other teams around the world. And still, it doesn't matter whose name she's wearing on the front because she's playing for something more. Monica Wright worked hard to make it to the WNBA. It had been her dream since she got the attention of college coaches when she was only 13 years old. I'm Monica Wright, number 22 for the Minnesota Lynx. She's played five seasons with the Minnesota Lynx, the team who selected her in the first round of the 2010 WNBA draft. It came after a stellar career at the University of Virginia. In her senior year, she earned top honors, including ACC Player of the Year and National Defensive Player of the Year. I knew I was always gonna be faster, stronger, maybe bigger in some cases. I'm not bigger now, but I guess that was just the one thing that set me apart from most of the girls my age. Monica went to UVA on a full ride. Two things consumed her life. I'm a basketball player, so I need to play basketball and do well on the court. I need to make my grades so that I can stay eligible. There was no time to try to figure out who I was because who I was was a student athlete at that time. But it wasn't all business. Her philosophy was to study hard, play hard, and party hard. Then in her senior year, Monica started thinking that perhaps there was more to life. Once you come to your end, you want to make sure that there was probably a little bit more purpose to your journey. You know, you want to look back and see, what did I do? What was my legacy? I felt like maybe I should be doing something more constructive, like there was something missing. Around that time, she started noticing that the Christian athletes she knew seemed to have life figured out. Or there was something I desired that they had, and I wanted to know what it was. But I never went up to them and asked them. That was just something that maybe I wasn't, I was afraid of, or something I was a little insecure about. Um, so God came up to me. That year, Monica met a local pastor while riding a bus home from class. He suggested she study the Bible with his wife. Monica decided to give it a shot. But she had to be convinced that the claims in the Bible were true and set out to prove they weren't. Yeah, initially I was trying to find fault and see where I could catch her in a, maybe a contradiction. At the time, Monica was taking a German philosophy class where she learned about Martin Luther and his works. Both the class and the pastor's wife challenged her thinking. I'm reading these books and then I'm studying with this lady about the Bible and the solidity of the Bible and what the Bible is and how true it is and how, how can we be sure. Really wanted me to search it out for myself. Read about, you know, who canonized the Bible, you know, the Council of Nicaea, what happened when people were deciding what books to put in the Bible, what books were left out, why were they left out. The more Monica studied the Bible, the more she saw how God had ordered everything including her life. So she started by making some changes. Once I just stopped cold turkey, some things that I was doing, drinking, going out, partying, dressing in a certain way, um, you know, my language, you know, changed altogether. My attitude about my teammates and basketball changed altogether. Still, Monica felt there was something more. After a year of study, she realized that knowledge alone wasn't enough to bring the change she needed. Okay, I'm over this. I've looked and studied and read everything there is to read. Bottom line is, me as a person, I'm not who I want to be. I've read scripture upon scripture about how I can change my everyday life, and I've done it. I've put it into action. Overall, I can't be who I need to be without Christ. Monica went to church and gave her heart to Jesus Christ and was baptized at the same time. She admits she doesn't often show emotion, but that day she did. So I had people there that knew me as well that didn't know I was studying the Bible and they were just like, this is the Monica we know. And so it was awesome. And then that's where 
I just got, went up into the tub and they just dumped me in and I came out and it was just great. Later that year, her dream came true when she signed with Minnesota. Now going into her sixth season, Monica has had her ups and downs, but she's not complaining. It's all part of playing the game she loves. And when the day comes, she hangs up her jersey for good. She knows who has a plan. God has definitely spoken to my heart and said that, you know, this is a pause in preparation for more that I have planned for you in the future. I trust him and, you know, I'm just going to hold fast to those promises and knowing that he has the best intent for me and he knows exactly what I need. I like it. I'm going to hold on to those promises. I know he's got the best intent for me and I'm going to just do what he thinks. That's the way to look at life. There is a God. He's in control of things. We've talked earlier in this program about the terrible holocaust that may confront us in this world as rogue nations gain control of nuclear power and they can obliterate whole cities with one bomb. Terrible to contemplate. But yet God Almighty is in charge of this world. He's in charge of this life. He's in charge of you. And Monica Wright had it right. He's got a plan for me. Now, God's got a plan for you, and I'm willing to trust it. Would you like to trust him? I tell you, if you know the Lord, this world one day is going to end. The universe as we know it will melt in fiery heat, and God will make a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to recreate things. It'll make all things new. And I want to be part of that, and so do you. If you want to be part of the heavenly kingdom that God has prepared, just ask him now. Let him take charge of your life and say, Lord, from this moment on, I'm yours. You'd like that decision? I want you to pray with me right now. Just bow your head wherever you are. Pray these words. Jesus, that's right, pray with me. Jesus, I know that you died to save me from sin. And you died to make me part of the new kingdom, the new heaven and new earth. And so, Lord, right now, I open my heart to you. I ask you to come in, take over my life, and from this moment on, I'm yours. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed with me, I want you to take one step more. I want you to call and tell somebody that you've just done it. It's so important that you confess what you just did. We have at the phones people who love you and they want to hear that good news because every one of them have had the same experience you had. Telephone number is 1-800-759-0700. And I also have a little uh, packet here. I've got a CD and I've got a little booklet. They'll help you. Say, what's next? If anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. You're a new creation. You've just made the most important decision in your life. So I'll ask you right now, call and say, I just prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to Jesus. Well, Wendy's got more as we continue this edition of the 700 Club. That's right, Pat. Still ahead, a woman whose grief led to crippling pain. I tried moving my head and it wouldn't move. It was so stiff. I was doing very little after that. I couldn't drive. I couldn't talk with anybody. But she could watch TV, and that's how she was healed in an instant. You'll hear exactly what happened. Plus, we'll be praying for you and your needs, so stay with us. And welcome back to The 700 Club. Christian author Josh McDowell says internet pornography is undermining the church more than external threats like gay marriage. McDowell says laws that declare traditional marriage beliefs bigoted may actually help Christian families stand out more and present a positive example to their neighbors. But he warns addiction to pornography is destroying pastors, church members, and their marriages. 
The Oklahoma House and Senate have passed a religious freedom bill to protect the rights of clergy. The legislation says pastors and others who perform weddings cannot be forced to perform same-sex weddings if that violates their religious beliefs. The measure also shields churches from being required to participate in the ceremonies. The House bill passed by a vote of 87 to 8, and the Senate bill passed nearly identical 38 to 5. All of the opposing votes came from Democrats. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Regent University, folks, I want to tell you, it's, it's enrolling eight weeks. Eight weeks sign up, and the next group starts eight weeks. They're doing a Master of Fine Arts in Film. We have received 360, 360 national and international film awards at Regent University with cinema, television. That's just one of the things that's there. They have now about 70 different programs. A new one is called Cybersecurity. Another one in advanced accounting, very and nursing, uh, all kinds of programs coming out that are very exciting. So you can find out about Regent University every eight weeks, a new cohort, a new class. One eight six six nine one zero seven six one eight. That's the number to call, or it's just log on to www.regentedu. Thousands and thousands of students coming in. Very exciting as this, uh, well, it's the world's preeminent Christian graduate university, Regent University. Wendy. All right. Well, when Joanne West hurt her neck, her life shut down. She was in so much physical pain, she couldn't do anything. But the source of that pain wasn't in her neck. It was in her grieving heart. Here's how she received a double healing. Take a look. Joanne West had grown accustomed to pain after losing her son to an illness in September of 2013. Greg had been sick for quite a while and he drifted away and went to meet the Lord. It was very hard for me to take. Every time I think about him, it got harder and harder. I became angry after a while and I, I, I worked vigorously on the property. I, I worked very hard to forget him and try to keep him off my mind. I questioned God a lot. I wondered why. I would never have thought that it would have affected me physically, but now I know it did. The physical pain came six months later after working around the house. Out of the clear blue came this terrible cramp in my neck. I came back in the house and I tried moving my head and it wouldn't move. It was so stiff. I was doing very little after that. I couldn't drive. I couldn't talk with anybody. And of course, I was still bitter, still angry. You know, I realized it was way down deep, and I didn't realize how deep it really was. Her neck pain continued until the evening before a doctor's visit when Joanne was taken by surprise. And I turned the channel to that Robertson 700 Club and they were in the process of praying. And Pat said, someone out there has a difficulty in their neck. Nice, but it was something that just jerked your neck and all of a sudden um, you've been having these headaches and everything is straightened out. Just put your hand on your neck in the name of Jesus, it is made whole. I knew it was me. I knew that God had given him that message. And I, I, I thank God for that right then. But he said to put your hand up on the neck. In Jesus' name, amen. And I did feel the healing. The warmth went all through me. And I shook my head and I said, I'm healed, I'm healed. Instantly, my head was moving. There was not a single problem. Never had a problem since. And I knew for a fact it was because God Almighty visited me that evening in more ways than one. One healed pain caused the other to surface. The total power of the healing was not just in the neck, it was also in the heart. Because after all the grief I had suffered and the sorrow, I, I realized he was doing an instant healing of all kind. 
the miracle of the sorrow had been also healed. He's my everything. Jesus is my everything. And so often our physical pains are tied to our emotional pains. And you know what? God's big enough to heal it all at once or one at a time like he did with Joanne. But uh, we've got some great praise reports, yeah, Pat. Really? That was an incredible testimony. Mm -hmm. um, here's one from uh, for more than a year. Diane of Brandeton, Florida, suffered with dry eye that caused pain and blurred vision. As time passed, it became more severe. Then one day, Diane was watching the 700 Club when she heard you, Pat, give a word of knowledge. You said your eye socket is inflamed and your eyes protruding out of your eye socket. Diane immediately felt a warmth come over her and she has not had any pain since and she can see clearly. Praise the Lord. One more. This is uh, Karen who lives in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, she had a uh, post a pericardial cyst in her lung, six and a half centimeters. It was a big one. Mm. Doctors took a CT scan and said, we're not sure we can do surgery. Uh, she called up for prayer. And later, the doctor took x-rays. The cyst was completely gone. And Karen is praising God. God answers prayer, folks. Yes. Now, Wendy and I are going to pray. Well, what is your need? Are you sick? Have you got some condition? Are you in pain? You have financial problems? God can take care of everything. He is absolutely able to do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think. And we're going to pray. We're going to join hands. We're going to believe God. Father, Thank you, God. I join right now with Wendy. We yes. believe God in the name you, of Jesus. A stiff shoulder has just been uh, unlocked. I mean, his joint been locked up. It's now set free. Move it around and all the pain is gone. Uh, there's a muscle under your heart. You thought you were having a heart attack and it's somehow a uh, pulled muscle and it acts like a heart attack. Just put your hand on your side and in the name of Jesus, God just healed you. Uh, Wendy? Yeah, God is touching people right now with arthritis and also carpal tunnel. Uh, I know that's going to be very painful, so just receive your healing right now, in Jesus' name. There's something called iritis. Uh, you, your eyes are just terribly inflamed, and it's like the eye sockets are inflamed all around. And um, this condition is bacterial, I believe. Just put your hand over your eyes in the name of Jesus, and He's just mm -hmm. healed you in uh, the name of Jesus. A, a swollen tongue has been healed in Jesus' name. Uh, left knee, it's swollen. You've got, I think, a, a bandage around it right now. You have, you've been limping. Uh, just put your hand on your knee. You'll feel heat. God has just healed you. Wendy, what else you? And there's people that are crying out. They saw uh, the piece about Joanna, and they said, Lord, I know my physical issue is also related to an emotional issue, and they're asking for the total healing. And Lord, right now, you are granting that wish. You are granting a double portion healing to those who are asking you for it right now. They know, Lord, they can't do it without you. Peace like a river. You've been troubled in heart. There's peace coming right now. Peace like a river flowing from the throne of God. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. 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 Wonderful. Call us. Tell <laughs> us what God has done for you. We'd love to hear it. We'd like to get those reports. And just praise God. If you want further prayer, the number's on your screen. You can call in. So we've got yes. some questions. Right. It builds our faith, too. It does. Amen. Amen. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. Well, right. we uh, still had, we're going to bring it on with your email question. Samantha says, I'm made fun of because my peers, they get, make fun of me because I'm a virgin. Should I have sex so I can fix it? We'll tackle that more later on today's show. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. All right, welcome back to the 700 Club. It's time to bring it on with your questions. This viewer says, what does God mean when he says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness? Uh, in the Greek language, uh, the word for perfect, teleos, it, it has a, a sense of completion. And uh, so what God essentially is saying is that uh, my strength is completed in you. Uh, my strength, as you are weak, my strength is, is, is added to, it adds to you, but it also your weakness completes me. It makes the wholeness 
of the teleos in, in me. And I think that's the idea. It's a little hard to grasp, but that's what he's talking about. It's one of my favorite scriptures yeah, in the yeah. Bible. All right. Okay, Samantha writes in, some of my friends aren't virgins anymore, and at times I feel like I need to lose my virginity, virginity too. But anytime I try, I back out before it happens, and then I'm made fun of for backing out. It's not that I'm scared. It's just I always thought my first time would be with someone I loved and who loved me. But I don't want to be made fun of just for being a virgin. What do I do? Um, Samantha, darling, what's sex about? What's it for? Uh, well, it's for making babies. Uh, a man and a woman get together, and they create life. And that life is supposed to come out of love. It's supposed to be the product of love. And in our society, uh, if you want to do it right, you get married so that the two of you will raise a child together. Now you say, <clears throat> you just don't have sex because your buddies are doing it. But here's the thing. Let me tell you about your teenager. So you want to have sex. First of all, the first time out, it's going to hurt. You won't like it. And teenage boys aren't very skilled in what they do. And uh, they, they don't know what they're doing. They don't have any skill about bringing pleasure to a, a woman. They don't know what they're doing. And uh, what they do know that they're going to tell about it. So you say yes to some guy and you have sex together. It's quick and it's painful and you didn't like it, but you did it. And so he's going to go tell his buddy, I just made out with Samantha. And she was hot, or she was passionate, or she was, uh, you know, a slut, or whatever. So that goes out on Twitter and wherever other of social media. And suddenly, everybody in your high school, everybody in your neighborhood knows that you put out to Charlie, or whoever he is. And the next guy that takes you out will say, well, you did it with Charlie. You ought to do it with me. And the next thing, you are, your reputation is ruined. Now, that's what happens. Keep your virginity. You've got something very special. Those other girls, you can say, I got something you don't have. <laughs> and, and you've already given yours away, and I haven't. I'm saving it to marriage, and it's going to be great. All right, what else? Oh, great advice, Pat. Thank Samantha, you. wait. <laughs> uh, wait on the Lord. All right, Francis writes Our pastor just taught that the tithe and offerings are the same as first fruits. I thought first fruits was a separate offering. Yeah, your pastor hadn't read the Bible right. Uh, the first fruits were you walked in uh, to an area and uh, you planted a crop and uh, the first fruits comes out. So that is an offering you give to the priest at a basket and here's my first fruits. This is for my a, a new endeavor. Then as you begin to uh, harvest your crops, a tithe is a tenth of that. So first fruits and tithes. You read the Bible. It's in there. It's in Deuteronomy particularly. You can see it. All right. All right, Kevin says, I am working night shift again, and I have always had difficulty sleeping long enough to pre prepare for my night. I have tried melatonin, magnesium, and valerian root. None of these have helped me sleep periods longer than three hours at a time. I also have had a challenge with whether to sleep when getting off work or waiting till later prior to work time. Any help you can provide is greatly appreciated. Um, I think the best thing to do in all services is to get another job. You know, there's sleep cycles, and uh, when people are working late, uh, their sleep cycle is interrupted. There's the rhythm, and uh, it can destroy your life. So to get a daytime job. But uh, I, I think when you get, get off work, the guys go out, and they're going to have some drinks, or they're going to party, or you're going to stay up, and then uh, you, you'll, you'll try to sleep during the day, and there's noise, and the kids are running around making noise, and uh, the neighbors outside, and there, there's a lot of activity, and there's no quiet. Uh, we have to sleep. And uh, you say, do I have any advice? I, my advice is get another job. I really think that will kill you when you're doing. I don't care wh how important it is. I'm sure you can find something where you can work day daytime. Mm. All right. All right. This viewer writes in, I tend to find myself counting how many times I sin. I know God made me righteous, but my mind always goes back to what I should have done and could have done. I want to learn from my mistakes and get closer to Jesus. What should I do? What you should do is, you're, the Bible says we're supposed to have our conscience cleared from dead works to serve the living God. God does not want you counting up your sins. Uh, he wants you to serve Him. And what you need to be is asking Him, who can I lead to the Lord? What service can I perform for you today? 
what can, who can I help? Where can I do something in your service? Not here's some sins I committed. Come off it. I mean, get your mind off these things. Get your mind on Jesus, and all you do is thank Him and get on with life. Well, we leave you today with today's Power Minute from uh, Matthew 17. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.